Chapter three, Stung. Pete saw the stone out of the corner of his eye. Duck, Pam, he shouted. His sister moved just in time and the stone sailed over her head. The thrower came in sight, Joey Brill. Bobby Reed raced up to them. He was being chased by Joey, who was throwing more stones. Help, Bobby shouted, help. When Joey saw the Hollister children, he was so surprised that he stopped short. This gave Pete a chance to act quickly. Before Joey could throw another stone, Pete flung himself at the boy. Together, they rolled over and over on the ground. Although Joey was a larger boy, Pete was quicker. He got to his feet immediately, and when Joey rose, Pete punched him in the nose. Ow, Joey cried. That's no fair. Three against one. I'll get even with you. He ran off down the path toward the stone bridge. Now that the troublesome bully was gone, Pete and Pam turned their attention to Bobby. He had fled to the shack and was standing by the front door. What happened, Pete asked, walking over to him. Bobby said Joey often bothered him, especially since he'd been selling vegetables and cookies for Farmer Gillis. He eats the cookies, Bobby said, and Mr. Gillis punishes me. When Joey saw me this time, I'd sold all the cookies and made him mad. He would do that to a smaller kid, Pete exclaimed in disgust. Well, for once he didn't get away with it, Bobby said. Thanks for helping me. Glad to, Pam said, adding, you helped us. Is this your loaf of bread? Yes, it is, thanks, Bobby replied. I left it in front of your store, didn't I? Is it for your mother? Pam asked. No, it's for Mr. Gillis. Mother's not here, the boy said sadly. She's gone away and I came here to see if there was any mail. I'm staying with Farmer Gillis until she returns, but he treats me awful mean. Bobby said that he and his parents had lived on a farm out west. His dad had died and Mrs. Reed was not strong enough to run the farm alone. Mother decided to write to my great grandfather who lived in Shoreham. He's our only relative. His name is Moses Twig. When Pete and Pam heard this, they looked at each other in surprise. Could Moses Twig possibly be the old Mo who put tags on fish? Bobby continued his story, saying that his mother had written to Moses Twig asking if she and Bobby might come east and help him with the fish and game store he'd owned for many years. But my great grandfather never answered her letter, the boy said. So mother thought we'd better come to Shoreham and talk things over with him. It took most of our money to buy the train tickets. Did you find him? Pam asked eagerly. No, Bobby replied. Great Grandpa Twig's fish and game store burned down some years ago, we were told. He disappeared mysteriously and nobody has heard from him since. Oh, how awful, Pam exclaimed. Why did your mother leave here, Pete asked. Bobby said she had gone out west again to look for work and had left him with Farmer Gillis. When she got a job and saved some money, she was to return and take Bobby away. I hope she comes real soon, he said, tears spilling from his eyes. Mr. Gillis isn't nice to me. The only one on the farm who likes me is Mrs. Bindle, the housekeeper. Let's go and see her, Pam suggested. Maybe she'll let you come over to our house to play and have lunch. Bobby brightened at the idea, and the children hurried to the Gillis farm, which was a mile away. Mrs. Bindle was a stout, motherly woman, who said Bobby might visit the Hollisters. He looked happier than he had at any time since they'd met him. When the children arrived home, they were amused to see little Sue Hollister and a roly-poly two-year-old boy named Stevie, who lived several houses away, trying to play croquet. Stevie was bending far over, using his own pudgy little hands rather than the mallet 
to push the ball through the wicket. Sue was struggling hard to show him how to strike the ball with a mallet. No, no, TV do it this way, the tiny fellow said firmly, throwing a ball through a wicket. I guess he's just too little, Sue sighed as she saw the others. At this moment, Stevie's mother came to the rear door of her home. Stevie, she called, Stevie. When the little fellow paid no attention, Sue said, your mother wants you. She took him by the hand and gently tried to pull him in the direction of his own yard. But the chubby boy did not want to go home and sat down so hard on the green grass that Sue lost her balance and fell on top of him. She got up and tried hard to pull him up, but he sat there, refusing to budge. No go home, he insisted. Stevie, his mother's voice rang out in alarm. All this time, Pete, Pam, and Bobby watched the little scene, trying not to laugh. It was so funny that finally all, they all began to giggle. Pam stepped forward and said, Sue will be glad to help you, dear. No, Sue replied firmly. He's my playmate and I'll take him home all by myself. She thought hard for a couple of moments and finally exclaimed, oh, I have a good idea. Maybe I can get him home with a sugar cookie. Sue raced into the kitchen and returned with a large one. As soon as Stevie saw it, he rose from the grass and walked toward her as fast as his pudgy little legs could go. Stevie want a cookie? Sue coaxed. She held it out just beyond his reach and began to walk rapidly in the direction of his own house. Stevie hungrily followed after the outstretched hand with the cookie in it. Here, Stevie, here, Stevie, Sue called out to him. She kept going in this fashion until the boy had safely reached his own yard. His mother laughed and thanked Sue, who now handed Stevie the cookie. Then the little girl ran back as fast as she could to her own yard, where the other children were waiting for her to join them at lunch. Pete had introduced Bobby to Mrs. Hollister and told her about his missing great-grandfather. The children sat down to a delicious lunch of soup and roast beef sandwiches. What's for dessert? Ricky asked eagerly. His mother said that was a surprise. And in a few minutes, she served them large bowls of ice cream. Bobby laughed and said he had not had so much fun in a long time. When they finished, the children helped clear the table, then went outside to play. <clears throat> Suddenly, Holly cried out in dismay. Oh, that Joey, she said. I knew he was up to something. The boy was hammering a croquet wicket into the ground. Stop that, Pete cried, going toward him. Joey dashed around the side of the house with Zip barking at his heels. Suddenly, he tripped over the jar which Ricky had set near a bush the jar in which he had trapped the bee. The lid flew off and the bee buzzed out. As Joey ran, it alighted on his ankle and stung him. Oh, ow, he cried. Thinking there might be more bees, Joey dashed out of the yard as fast as he could and headed for his own home. As the children watched him go, Mrs. Hollister opened the door and said there was a telephone call for Pete. He went inside. The call was from Tinker. He said that two people had brought in fish bigger than Pete's and that the whole town was talking about the contest. I thought maybe you'd like to come down and look at them, he said. I sure would, Pete replied. When he told the others, all the children said they wanted to see the fish. Bobby was particularly enthusiastic. He seemed to have forgotten all his troubles and dashed from the front door with the Hollisters. Then suddenly a look of fright came over his face. He stopped running and stared toward a car which had just parked in front of the house. What's the matter, Pam asked him, noticing the strange look in his eyes. I, 
I'm afraid I'm in for trouble, Bobby said. He pointed. That's Mr. Gillis getting out of the car. The other children had stopped short too. They stood quietly as the man started up the walk. He paid no attention to the Hollisters. In fact, he walked right past them. Grasping Bobby by the shoulder, he said in an angry voice, what do you mean by coming here, you little scamp? You're supposed to be downtown selling vegetables and cookies for me. Bobby tried to explain that Mrs. Bindle had said he could come and have lunch with his new friends, but Mr. Gillis hardly paid any attention to him. Mrs. Bindle isn't in charge, he shouted. I am. Your mother expects you to be of some use while you're staying at my house. Now come along with me. He started pushing Bobby toward the car, but suddenly he stopped and faced the Hollister children. You're to blame for this, he roared. You stay out of my business, and don't you ever try to see Bobby again or you'll be sorry, he thundered at them. He shoved Bobby into the car and slammed the door. Then he went around to the driver's seat, got in, and roared off down the street. The Hollister children looked at one another. Finally, Holly said, Mr. Gillis is a mean man. I'll say he is treating Bobby like that, Pam agreed. I'm going to tell mother, Holly said. She hurried into the house and reappeared with Mrs. Hollister. Can't you make that man be nice to Bobby Reed, mother, she was saying. I wish I'd seen him, Mrs. Hollister sighed. Perhaps I could have persuaded Mr. Gillis to let Bobby stay. We could have bought all his cookies, Pam said. Why didn't we think of that sooner? I'm afraid it's too late now, her mother said. All the children were dejected, thinking what might happen to their friend. Oh, I do hope he doesn't get a spanking, Pam said fervently. Poor Bobby, Holly burst out. Do you think Mr. Gillis meant what he said, that we can never see him again? 